5. Assassination This was a Vietnamese general's coup, yes, but I think the fundamentals of it were decided in our White House. William Colby, Director of the CIA The warmth of Honolulu did not extend to the three senior American officials who were meeting there at Pacific headquarters on the 21st of August, 1963. Their differences over the distant war brought tension to the conference room where the outgoing ambassador to Vietnam. Frederick E. Nolting faced his successor, Henry Cabot Lodge. Although he was the new man, Lodge, as always, exuded certainty, and now, en route to Saigon, he had one word for the problem that lay ahead of him. DM. Nolting, always expressive of his feelings, his quip of the day was that he had been dislodged, was saying with some passion that President Diem had promised to make concessions to the Buddhist, and so the crisis was almost over. The third man, Assistant Secretary of State Roger Hilsman, kept a discreet silence. He was there to oversee formally the courtesy meeting, and he could not let his skepticism show. Nolting was saying that Diem always kept his word. Then the news came over the wire, the most sacred Zaloi pagoda in Saigon, and other main Buddhist temples all across the country had been raided by the special police. Thirty monks had been injured and fourteen hundred arrested. Then, says Hillsman, the ticker tape came over that they had beaten up the pagodas. I can remember Nolting in a shocked voice saying, But he promised me, he promised me. Hillsman and Nolting were on the next plane to Washington. Lodge reached Saigon within hours, finding a curfew and soldiers at all the intersections. Even high school students had been jailed in the widening riots. The pagoda raids had clearly been timed to the absence of an American ambassador. The U.S. had now to decide whether DM was totally challenging its authority, as was feared, or merely misreading the signals. Washington had been ambiguous on the significance of the change of ambassadors, with Nolting and Lodge getting a different emphasis from President Kennedy. Before leaving Saigon, Two years earlier than expected, Nolting was asked by Diem whether U.S. aid and support for his government would remain the same. Nolting cabled the State Department. I said it was very crucial and got a reply which said from the highest authority, which is the shorthand for the president, you can assure him that there's no change in American policy in this respect. At the time Kennedy was telling Henry Cabot Lodge, I have confidence in you and I want you to go out there and see if we can't get the government to behave better. As a Republican and a Boston Brahmin, Lodge was anyhow viewed as very much his own man. He was given exceptional powers, including, in fact, control over the aid flow. This meant life-or-death leverage over South Vietnam. It could be applied against Diem, or to support him. Governing power could only lie with the recipient of the U.S. aid. In Saigon, Lodge began with a symbolic cutoff by delaying the usual diplomatic rounds. 
Having arrived at night, he was on the street the next morning, personally questioning people in French on their opinions of the Buddhist crisis and Diem's rule. He pointedly visited the Za Loi Pagoda. U.S. displeasure was now very evident. Within two days, the 24th of August in Washington, Lodge sent an urgent cable to his established channel, Roger Hillsman. It advised that the embassy had been approached by a number of Vietnamese generals. The generals had information that the special police run by Diem's brother, Ngo Dinh Nhu, were planning a purge of the military. These generals, as Hillsman quotes Lodge, might take matters into their own hands and pull a coup. Lodge had spent a month at Pentagon briefings. He should know if developments were urgent. Hillsman regarded the cable as top priority. It was Saturday morning in Washington. President Kennedy, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara were all out of town. But their deputies, Avril, Harriman, and James Forrestal, were available, and with their help, Hillsman began to draft a boilerplate emergency response. It made clear that Washington would no longer tolerate news influence over Diem. The president was to remove his brother from power. Failing this, the generals were to be told that all U.S. economic and military support would be discontinued. With the wording complete, Hillsman called both President Kennedy and Secretary of State Rusk to brief them quickly on the situation. They approved his response, and Hillsman then sent what became known as the Green Light Cable. It did not deal with the warning about a coup and therefore seemed to countenance one. This rushed reply, Hillsman says, is not as infrequent an occurrence, an occurrence in American foreign policy as you might think. This happens a lot of times. There is a boilerplate reply when you're ill at ease with the country, which is what we will examine any new government on its own merits. Again, this happens a lot of times. There is a boilerplate reply when you're ill at ease with the country, which is that we will examine any new government on its own merits. According to Hillsman, the implications of the cable were fully grasped and greatly strengthened by Rusk, who inserted a paragraph stating that if there were problems in Saigon, then attempts would be made to deliver supplies for the war effort through Hugh. This implied support for any prolonged rebellion. The overall gist of the cable admits Hillsman was to say that we would prefer a government continuing over Diem, but if they, the generals, felt they had no choice, then we would examine the government that they established on its own merits. Now, of course, there is no question that this, with all of its hedges, does encourage them. Ambassador Lodge interpreted the cable as meaning go out and see if there is a coup, and so he sent out the CIA, says William Colby, then chief of, chief of the CIA's Far East Division in Langley, Virginia. In this senior position, Colby saw all cables at the agency's Virginia headquarters. The controversial 24th of August cable told Lodge that he must press DM to take prompt, dramatic action to correct the Buddhist crisis. It instructed him that, at the same time, he should tell key military leaders that continued aid would be impossible unless action was taken immediately. Lodge now 
called in the U.S. commander, General Paul Harkins, and other senior personnel. On the next day, the 25th, the embassy sent a return cable accepting the instructions, but defining them as a basic decision from Washington. In Saigon, early on the 26th, a Voice of America news broadcast blamed Nigo Din News secret police for the pagoda raids, thus absolving the army. At the same time, the semi-official radio network speculated on a suspension of U.S. aid. On Monday, the 26th, after five days in Saigon, Lodge went to present his credentials to President Diem and to present the demand for news removal as senior advisor. But by now, Nehu had become the eyes and ears and iron hand of the recluse president. Diem was coldly unreceptive, says Lodge. In this crucial first conversation between the two men, Lodge does not recall what was actually said, only what was inferred. He almost said to me, Well, what business is it of yours whether I have my brother here to advise me or not? To which, of course, there was a very good answer. It's my business because the President of the United States has made it my business. I didn't say that, but I thought that. President Kennedy himself was having Monday morning second thoughts as Lodge faced DM. The National Security Council was convening at the White House. Kennedy learned that a Saigon CIA agent, Colonel Lucien Conian, was even then briefing the Vietnamese generals. There was consensus that matters were proceeding too fast. Washington needed more precise information on which generals were involved, exactly what they planned, and on the possibilities of President Diem confronting conforming. Lodge was to be asked for more details. But the 24th of August instructions had not been retracted, and in the opinion of ex-ambassador Nolting, then back at the State Department, the green light cable had prejudiced the position almost beyond Kennedy's recall. The access of Lodge and Under Secretary of State Harriman was too strong for President Kennedy to thwart or overcome, even if he wanted to, and I was not sure whether he wanted to, and Nolting, who would resign from the department over the DM affair, says Secretary Rusk just bowed to the prevailing mood. Rusk was this way and that way. Rusk says that long before the green light cable Washington's growing impatience with DM was known to the generals. In Rusk's version, it was the generals who dictated events. I suppose the South Vietnamese military came to the conclusion that if they replaced President DM, somehow we would try to live with the results. In the CIA version, the generals were at first extremely nervous over the agency's follow-up approach to them. As William Colby recalls, We frightened an awful lot of generals. They were terrified that this would get back to the government and lead to their arrest and incarceration, at least. And they said no at that time. But they said that if we get interested, we will give you a call. The generals began to weigh which was the greater danger, a coup attempt or no attempt. A U.S. aid cutoff could mean their own demise as well as DM's. But for them, the more immediate danger was that DM would get warning and strike first. Initially, only one of them, General Kiem, met with CIA agent Lucien Conian. Although Conian was well known to him, Kiem wanted higher credentials who in the embassy or in Washington had authorized the approach. Conian was not at liberty to say. In an interview recorded for NBC television in December 1971, he said, it was quite obvious that if at any one point the American hand had shown, the whole thing would blow up and it would be an extreme embarrassment. 
Therefore, Ambassador Lodge made it very clear to me that if something went wrong, he would have to be able to have deniability that I even existed. After meeting Kiem on the 26th, Konian had no nothing specific about a coup to report to Lodge, and Lodge now had Washington's second thoughts cable requested more, requesting more details, not least on whether President Diem might still be won over. With little information from Konian, the most hesitant general at that moment was U.S. Commander Harkins. He doubted that the coup forces would prove strong enough. Harkins expressed this to Lodge and then cabled the Secretary of Defense, urging restraint at the Department of State. Washington's response on the 27th was to request both Harkins and Lodge for a joint up-to-the-moment assessment. On the 28th, the CIA and the generals again made contact, and this time Konian found himself dealing with no less than President Diem's personal military advisor, General Duong Van Ming, known as Big Ming because of his six-foot height and bulk. Konian learned the names of other interested generals, as well as his first contact, Tran Thien Kiem. The lineup included regimental commanders Nguyen Khan, Li Van Kim, and Nguyen Van Thieu. But the position was the same. The generals needed formal notification of U.S. government support, meaning a direct endorsement from Ambassador Lodge. Lodge and General Harkins again conferred, then Lodge sent Washington a strong recommendation for action. His cable, quoted from the Pentagon Papers, included the following points. 1. We are launched on a course from which there is no respectable turning back the overthrow of the DM government. 2. The chance of bringing off a general's coup depends on them to some extent, but it depends at least as much on us. 3. We should proceed to make all-out effort to get the generals to move promptly. In point 8, Lodge stated that General Harkins thinks I should ask Diem to get rid of the news before starting the general's actions. But I believe that such a step has no chance of getting the desired result and would have a very serious effect of being regarded by the generals as a sign of American indecision and delay. Lodge concluded by saying that except for point A, General Harkins concurs in this telegram. Of course. In Washington, the National Security Council hastily convened. There was intense day-long debate, and the final decision was to leave Ambassador Lodge with the responsibility of determining policy. Secretary of State Dean Rusk now personally cabled Lodge. Rusk noted the different views on whether President Diem should first be persuaded to remove his brother New and the equally unpopular Madame New, but Rusk said this was best coupled with sanctions on U.S. aid when the generals were ready to move. The generals could then negotiate directly with Diem on the news. Rusk cautioned against applying sanctions until the generals were ready because Rusk cabled. If Diem was alerted, he might take some quite fantastic actions such as calling on North Vietnam for assistance in expelling the Americans. President Kennedy had just publicly explained why he thought Vietnam was important, stating, We don't want to have a repetition of China because that was the most damaging event certainly that's occurred to us, perhaps in this country, in this century. In Vietnam, the denial of a religious flag three months earlier had caused the festering of a situation which, if it continued, might have no flag to defend. Privately, 
Kennedy was studying ways of withdrawing from Vietnam. But at the same time, he was taking greater risk, as he now admitted in a prophetic cable to Ambassador Large. A U.S. Senate study shows that on the 29th of August, when Lodge had his recommendations confirmed, Kennedy also cabled as follows. I have approved all the messages you are receiving from others today, and I emphasize that everything in these messages has my full support. We will do all that we can to help you conclude this operation successfully. Until the very moment of the go signal for the operation by the generals, I must reserve a contingent right to change course and reverse previous instructions. While fully aware of your assessment, this is what got him killed. While, <clears throat> excuse me, while fully aware of your assessment of the consequences of such a reversal. I know from experience that failure is more destructive than an appearance of indecision. I would, of course, accept full responsibility for any such change. As I must also bear the full responsibility for this operation and its consequences. With the president himself now endorsing a coup and accepting the consequences, CIA agent Konian again contacted the generals asking their intentions. Two days later, the 31st of August, General Meng gave his reply and he tactically backed off. He said his forces were not yet ready and there was no date in sight. At this point, says Ambassador Lodge, the generals were very unwilling to take Americans into their confidence because they thought Americans talk too much and it was impossible for an American to keep a secret. So that whole so-called coup evaporated. The generals now heard the strongest yet official U.S. criticism of the DM government stated by Kennedy himself. On the 2nd of September, the President said in an interview with Walter Cronkite on CBS television that the U.S. would continue assistance to South Vietnam, but Kennedy added, I don't think the war can be won unless the people support the effort, and in my opinion, in the last two months the government has gotten out of touch with the people. Kennedy's Assistant Secretary of State, Roger Hillsman, considers this public criticism to have been the catalyst. We knew that there was a coup plotting, but we did not know when it was scheduled. Hillsman felt at the time that Kennedy's comments on television were our contribution to the coup. Kennedy said that he was very pessimistic. This is on public television, but that perhaps with a change of policy and a change of personal victory was possible. What Kennedy had in mind, says Hillsman, was a pro-Buddhist policy and the removal of Diem's brother, Niu. On a second national television hookup, Kennedy was asked about continuance of aid, and Kennedy said, we will continue aid which furthers the war effort, and we will stop aid which interferes with it. He meant that we were cutting off aid to Brother Neo's pet projects, but we would continue aid to the army. Now, in hindsight, I think that encouraged it. Whether encouraged or not, the generals in Saigon kept silent. In early September, Kennedy sent Secretary of Defense Robert Strange McNamara and a group of advisors to observe firsthand McNamara's assistant, William Bundy. When on this 10-day visit, the tide of opposition included not only Buddhists and students, but leading members of the government who came to us quietly and told us there simply was no way for this to go on unless Diem totally reformed his administration. 
I think it was virtually inevitable that there was going to be a change if DM went on as he did. Bundy says the American role with the generals was really one of saying, we won't try to stop this, and we will work with you if you do it. But we were hoping, hoping to the last, that DM would stop the repression. With the return of the mission, the Kennedy administration began what William Colby of the CIA recalls as the most agonizing and intense period of debate I've experienced inside our government. The National Security Council was back to the drawing board, but with no outline emerging, nothing had been resolved. The generals remained silent. DM obdurate. For weeks the debate raged over the unbendable and unpredictable Mandarin who could not survive without the United States, but this was the fear who might decide to try to bid his ally to leave. Could DM be coerced? Should aid be totally suspended? Or should the U.S. fully back DM, put aside the political problems, and concentrate wholly on winning the war in the countryside? In Colby's words, there was very intense division of opinion. On the 2nd of October, Kennedy approved a much-revised policy resulting from the intense month-long review. DM would be given until the end of the year. The U.S. would then announce the withdrawal of a thousand American advisors, and military aid would go on to the generals who opposed DM. Meantime, Ambassador Lodge was instructed by Kennedy to take no further steps in support of a coup, but to keep cultivating alternative leaders. The new policy held good for one day. On the 3rd October, General Duong Van Ming informed CIA agent Konian that a coup was being planned, and according to Konian's eventual Senate testimony, Ming outlined various courses of action, including assassination of DM's brother, Niu. It emerged that the generals had interpreted a much stronger go signal shortly before the, when Washington recalled Saigon, CIA Station Chief Richardson. The significance of this was only realized much later at the State Department, says Roger Hillsman. Ambassador Lodge was quarreling with Richardson. The quarrel had nothing to do with the coup, but Lodge insisted that Richardson be removed, and it's one of those happenings in Vietnamese eyes. Richardson was very close to Niu and Diem, and so the removal of Richardson sent a signal to the Vietnamese generals that we did not intend. For the first time, the generals had outlined actual coup plans, but the hint of assassination alarmed CIA Director McCone. He went personally to President Kennedy and, according to Senate testimony, told him, Mr. President, if I was manager of a baseball team and I had one pitcher, I'd keep him in the box, whether he was a good pitcher or not. DM's removal, McCone argued, would merely lead to a succession of coups. McCone left Kennedy believing that the president had agreed to a hands-off policy. The CIA response to Saigon on the 5th of October unequivocally stated, We certainly would not favor assassination of DM, and concluded believe best approach is hands-off. However, we are naturally interested in intelligence of any such coup plan. The night of the same day, the 5th, Konian was summoned to meet General Ming. Konian relayed the message that the U.S. opposed assassination and was told, All right, you don't like it. We won't talk about it anymore. But General Ming insisted that he must know the final U.S. position in respect to a coup scheduled for the near future. Konian checked back with Ambassador Lodge 
My instructions were that I was to inform General Meng that the United States would not thwart their coup. And I conveyed this. From now on, the CIA agent found himself dealing with a new, impressive go-between, Chief of Staff General Tran Van Dong. There were several meetings during October, and another important signal to the generals. On the 17th of October, the U.S. informed the Saigon government that aid to Ngo Dinh News Special Forces would only be continued if channeled through the Army Command. The generals, however, were still concerned that the U.S. was not fully behind them. General Dong had met Ambassador Lodge at a party and in private conversation. Lodge had given no indication that he was aware of a coup. On the 25th of October, says General Don, once again Lucien Conian came to ask me when we planned to make the coup. How to answer him, I didn't know. And I asked him again, are you authorized from the American side to talk to me and discuss with me about the coup? And he said, yes, by Lodge. I said, Lodge didn't tell me anything. It was arranged that Lodge would make contact with the general at an airport function the next day. That day, says Don, I went to the airport and met Lodge. I asked him immediately, is Konian with you? He told me Konian was his representative. I said, now I know. And I talked to Lodge, saying the morale of the Vietnamese forces is low because of the Buddhist affair, and something must be changed. And Lodge said, If you need me, we are ready to help you. And I told him, Mr. Ambassador, we have enough means already. What we need is your support, the support of the United States, if we would succeed. And I told him, Please don't interfere in the case because this is a Vietnamese affair between the Vietnamese themselves. General Don, confident that he had direct access to Lodge, summoned Agent Conian three days later, the 28th of October, and said, Come over to our offices. We are having a meeting. There, Conian learned that the coup was imminent. General Don told him that the exact time would be made known to the embassy only hours before. But he requested that Ambassador Lodge should not cancel a scheduled trip to Washington for fear of tipping off the palace. The trip had been arranged for the 31st of October. As the countdown proceeded, Washington was again in turmoil. On the 30th of October, the U.S. commander, General Harkins, sent a furious cable suggesting that he trusted neither the generals nor Lodge, stating General Don is either lying or playing both ends against the middle. He told Conian, the coup will be before November 2nd. He told me he was not planning a coup. Harkins said that if a coup was in progress, he had not been informed by the ambassador, and he was, has received, and that he has received any such plan. We didn't know, contends Ambassador Lodge. They kept a secret awfully well, and I respected them for it. I wasn't brought into the picture in a complete way until literally the night before, with the White House gravely concerned over the rift between between the Defense and State Departments, Lodge was cabled on the same day, 30th October, and told to dissuade the generals unless he was absolutely sure the coup would succeed. A second urgent cable stated, We cannot accept conclusion that we have no power to delay or discourage a coup. But Lodge replied that it was too late it was in the hands of the Vietnamese. They didn't want us to interfere, says Lodge. They didn't want help in the planning, let alone weapons and equipment. They wanted it to take its course. They wanted the Vietnamese to run it. And Washington said they would stay out of it, and they stayed out of it. 
from the supervisory position up at the CIA, William Colby saw it quite differently. Now this was a Vietnamese general's coup, yes, but I think that the fundamentals of it were decided in our White House because a few weeks before the president in a press conference had said that it was essential to contemplate new people in the Vietnamese government, and that could only be interpreted as DM and his brother. We cut off the support the CIA was giving to a particular unit of the Vietnamese Army, Niu's Special Forces, and the interpretation of that was that if we were dissatisfied with the leadership, we could cut off assistance there. Now, these were green lights to the generals to go ahead, reinforced by their question. Would the United States support a successor regime? Answer from the White House? Yes. In Saigon, Ambassador Lodge delayed his scheduled 31st of October departure. At 10 a.m. on the 1st of November, the ambassador called on President Diem, together with General Harkins and visiting Pacific Commander Admiral, Admiral Felt. The President's press secretary, Ton That Thien, was present. Lodge kept President Diem busy until past 12. Each time, Admiral, <laughs> sorry, each time Admiral felt goes to leave lodge asked another question and we know now from the pentagon papers that lodge knew all along that the coup would be staged and he was simply pinning down president dm to deny him access to his staff downstairs mr niu this was a coincidence a strange coincidence was being asked all sorts of questions by General Phil. Afterwards, I talked to people who wanted to get in touch with either Mr. Niu or the President to tell him that there was something going on, and they couldn't get to him. They couldn't get any orders from the palace at all until the rebellious troops were on the outskirts of Saigon. You cannot say that this is sheer coincidence. Lodge gives his version. I went to see Mr. Diem because I was going back to Washington for a routine report. And I was to present Admiral Felt, Diem said. Every time the American ambassador goes to Washington, there's a rumor of a coup. He said, I hear these rumors now, and I know there's going to be a coup, but I don't know who is going to do it or where he's going to do it. And he said, the coup planners are very much cleverer this time and they've, than they've ever been before, because there are a number of them, and I can't find out which is the real one. That's what he said. That was noon. At 1.30 p.m., while Lodge was having lunch at the embassy, he recalls this tremendous automatic fire. It sounded as though it was right in the next room, and the planes flew overhead, and that was the beginning of the overthrow. The go-between General Tran Van Don then viewed the coup as perfect timing. The time was 1.30 in the afternoon. All coups everywhere in the world are made at night. We believe that the coup was a good coup, and we must do it in the daytime. It surprised many people, especially the presidency and the presidential guard, because we knew that at night they have to watch to be awake and have to sleep in the daytime. It was very good timing. The coup forces seized key installations, then surrounded Diem's palace. One division says General Don, was commanded by a colonel whose name was Nguyen Van Phieu. He was very famous after that. Don and the other generals had summoned all senior officers to central headquarters to ask them to support the coup. Only one, Colonel Tung Du, 
refused and was later executed. CIA agent Conian joined the generals at headquarters as the coup progressed. I had a special radio that kept me into a special net directly to the embassy. Plus, I had, with the junta's agreement, a special telephone line directly to the U.S. Embassy. I could be reached, says Ambassador Lodge, whether I was in my residence or in the office. I had the equipment to reach people locally and reach Washington to some extent. At 3 p.m., General Don called the embassy to ask if there was any plan to get Diem and his family out of Vietnam, if they were to surrender. He was assured that a plane was ready. Lodge himself had a plane standing by for his Washington visit. At 4 p.m., after Diem had twice refused to surrender, the coup forces began to mortar the palace, but resistance from Diem's presidential guard prevented an assault. Diem now appealed to the American ambassador. The telephone rang, says Lodge, and it was President Diem saying that the coup had begun, and he wanted to know what I was going to do. And I said the obvious truth, that I had no instructions, that it was four o'clock in the morning in Washington, and I'd had no opportunity to deal with it. He said, well, you must know what the policy is. Well, I said, I don't know what the policy is for every circumstance. And I said, I'm worried about your safety. I've made arrangements to get you out of the country so as to protect your safety. And if you don't like to do that, I've made arrangements which would authorize your becoming titular head of state, and you can stay here in a position of honor, and you'll be relatively safe. He said, I don't want to do that. I want to restore order, and I'm going back now to restore order. And he hung up. General Don says he tried to reason with Diem during the coup. Diem called me from his palace. I said to him, Mr. President, I am sorry for what has happened, but what I ask you now is be wise and understand the situation, and a special plane is ready if you surrender, without any conditions to carry you and your family out of Vietnam. Again, Diem and his brother, Nguyen Dinh Nguyen, refused to surrender. Using a secret exit, they escaped from the palace after dark, hiding at the home of a friend in Kolon, the Chinese quarter. From this base, they remained in touch with the generals throughout the night. At one point, defiantly calling on the generals to surrender. But at 3.30 in the morning of the 2nd of November, after aerial and were taken from the church to an armored personal carrier. General Don makes this allegation. I can say frankly that Big Ming, General Duong Van Ming, didn't want them alive. They were killed on the way to headquarters. General Ming's version is unobtainable. Of all the senior plotters, only he remained in Vietnam as Saigon fell on the 30th of April, 1975. Room prepared for them to rest. When the troops arrived at the Colon house, Diem and his brother were not there. They were discovered shortly after in a nearby Catholic church. The brothers surrendered unconditionally and were taken from the church to an armored personnel carrier. General Don makes his allegation. I can say frankly that Big Ming, General Duong Van Ming, didn't want them alive. They were killed on the way to headquarters. General Ming's version is unobtainable. Of all the senior plotters, only he remained in Vietnam as Saigon fell 30th of April 1975. That's a repeat. That's how it's written. Anyway. 
Ambassador Lodge says he was shocked. I had reports of him, DM culminating, of course, in the horrible, tragic reports of his assassination. Terrible thing, terrible thing, and I don't believe we know now whether that assassination was private initiative or in response to governmental initiatives. The first report issued by the generals had stated that the brothers had committed accidental suicide while trying to seize weapons. The CIA later obtained photographs of the bodies of Diem and Niu. They had been shot with their hands tied behind their backs. After the killings, General Don was delegated by the coup committee to explain matters to the American Embassy. On the 2nd of November, I was sent by the committee to the American Embassy where Ambassador Lodge was waiting for us to know more details about the results of the coup. We were very welcome at the gate of the Embassy. But in his office, Lodge told us immediately that President Kennedy and the people of the United States were very shocked. I told him it was not planned to kill Diem and you. What can I say now? What I have said to the family, we are very sorry. In Washington, President Kennedy heard of Diem's murder while in session with the National Security Council. His military advisor, General Maxwell Taylor, was present. The cable was brought in by one of the president's aides and put in front of him, and he read it. There was a silence around the table. The president was obviously shaken sprang to his feet and walked out of the room saying nothing to anybody and stayed out of the room for some minutes. Kennedy had now to endure the memory of his early cable to Ambassador Lodge accepting the consequences. He had approved a coup, then rejected it, then permitted it again. He had taken weeks arriving at various policies, only to abandon them within days. He had endorsed a political solution, preparing plans for the withdrawal of U.S. advisors. But at the same time, he had pursued an opposite course into the unknown, pledging military support for untested generals who had began by bloodying their own and America's image. And this image was his reason for being in Vietnam, to uphold and guard American ideals. In this, he had tried to serve America. And Diem, he had fought the communists for nine years. He deserved a better end than assassination, Kennedy told his silent aides when he re-entered the room. William Colby of the CIA was president Kennedy was obviously upset, distraught. I think that he felt a sense of personal responsibility for it. Certainly, he hadn't anticipated it. Whether he should have or not is another question. Kennedy's special advisor, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., stated, It was no part of our plan or expectations that DM and his brother would be murdered. For reasons of their own, the generals decided to kill them. The death of Diem upset Kennedy, partly because he was a humane man and didn't like people being killed, particularly, perhaps, other heads of state, but in part because he may have feared that this was going to pull us in. It was a shock to all of us, says Kennedy's military advisor, Maxwell Taylor, but I think perhaps to the president more than any of us, because he didn't realize that we were all playing with fire, and we were at least giving tacit encouragement to the overthrow of this man. There were then, recalls Schlesinger, 16,000 American advisors attached to the army of Vietnam, there had been only 900 American advisors in Vietnam when Kennedy took office. The total number of Americans killed in combat in Vietnam by the end of 1963 was around 75. Obviously, 75 too many, but inconsiderable in comparison with the numbers that were to be killed later. 
after nearly three years of indecision. Read that again. Make something clear. After three years of indecision, Kennedy, belatedly, trying to prevent the coup, had planned to give DM a last chance. If DM had not confirmed within two months, Kennedy had privately decided to withdraw 1,000 troops as the beginning of America's withdrawal. But would he have done? Assistant Secretary of State Roger Hillsman says, We instituted a lot of planning in the State Department about how to withdraw, but we never dared send one of those pieces of paper to the Pentagon. He states that Kennedy trusted Defense Sec Secretary McNamara, but not the military. We thought that somebody on his staff might well undercut and destroy. So this whole documentary evidence of the other option, the option of withdrawal, is still not a public record. Could DM have survived in this confused U.S. policy situation? Most of Kennedy's men, who did not know of his last-minute withdrawal plans, considered DM's downfall a Vietnamese affair. The Vietnamese generals, however, effectively regarded the coup as American ordered, and it was staged only when the generals knew they would inherit American aid. DM's press secretary, Thien, quotes one of the coup's leaders, General Kim, on his motivations. I asked him afterwards because I considered him loyal to President Diem, and General Kim said, the Americans told us to choose between Diem and American aid. We had no choice. Washington now had no choice but to recognize the new Saigon government. A military junta headed by Generals Ming, Kim, and Ku go between Tran Van Don. None of Washington's foreboding was evident in Saigon, according to Ambassador Lodge. There was a great joy when a man has been a dictator, absolute ruler, for eight or nine years he begins to do things that he wouldn't do at the end of one year. So there was a great atmosphere of joy. The American embassy was extremely popular. People would cheer and wave flags when we, they went by. The cheers and the junta lasted three months. DM would be the last civilian strongman. In the next 20 months, there would be by 10 changes of government. There would be 10 changes of government, with the generals deposing each other. Major General Edward Lansdale, the American who had advised DM when he was the early hope, foresaw a tragedy for Vietnam. He was by this time in Washington with the CIA, and he says... The agency had been opposed to the way it happened. With his overthrow, they overthrew a constitution, and with the constitution, they waived orderly change, a way to reappoint province chiefs and district chiefs. In effect, the political move to knock off the chief of state actually was dividing politically in the face of a very alert, smart, energetic enemy. The North Vietnamese were startled that we would have participated in the overthrow of President Diem, and they were essentially caught by surprise, says William Colby. As the CIA's Far East director at that time, Colby hastened to Vietnam and reported back that the war would soon be over and lost. It really sounds incredible today, says Colby, looking back, that we made those decisions about getting rid of DM without really careful consideration about what kind of government would replace him. And of course, we got rid of a Mandarin to select some generals who would presumably bring about a more democratic government. The chaos and anarchy 
which infected the Vietnamese government at that time caused everything to fall apart. The assessments were very clear that the situation was going downhill very fast during 1964, and our assessment was that the communists would probably win the war by about the end of 1965. They began to send their military units, not just infiltrators, but military units, down the Ho Chi Minh Trail in the fall of 1964 to begin to build up the military force to administer the coup de grace. Now, President <coughs> Johnson, who was in charge of it at that time, was, of course, a very tenacious Texan, a very tough fellow, and he wasn't about to have that happen. That's the end of chapter five. Any questions about whose administration and whose indecisions let me... Sorry, I don't want to... People rave about the Bay of Tomkin. That was a provoked... A, you know what? Perhaps it was. But based on Kennedy's indecisions and flip-flopping around like an idiot, this led to... It, anyway, you decide for yourself. <laughs> That's the end of uh, Chapter 5. <laughs>